much the argument of the first teachers of the Christian church when they said about the divinity of Christ. This was the argument. They said, who can represent God but God? There is no way. I can't represent a man. You can represent a government or a country or whatever, but you cannot represent God. Only God can stand for God and say, I and God are one. I and the Father are one. So where we need his presence, we need the, the day, the the promise of the Holy Spirit that will lead us into the whole truth. There is no other teacher for us. Jesus told us about that. If somebody would, would do that or can do that, it would, it would be sin. But it's impossible. When we talk about God, we can talk about many things. But let's, let's take science. Somebody can talk science, different things. Other scientists way more advanced are in the pews and they laugh at that guy because he, his knowledge is way back, he's so partial, so little. In an area that, that is purely human. But when it's about talking about God, only God can help, only God can stand for God. So thank you very much for this song. I didn't know, Brenda, that you have such a beautiful gift, so. Yeah, you should take uh, note about that because the Bible says don't be uh, insensitive to your gift. The gift is given by the Lord. Very good, and uh, very good for all of us being present today in this place, especially for my heart because I always, I was sharing with Judy in the, in, during the break time that every time I come here, I feel freedom in my heart. I'm not afraid to talk with you and to share with you things that I would be afraid to talk about in other environment. I'm not afraid here. And I know you will not judge or condemn. You will take note of that. And I told Judy that would be very nice to have some afternoon debates about that. We could bring with us different materials. And uh, 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 as we talked with Mike this morning about uh, 144,000, that would be very nice to have one afternoon, the whole afternoon, uh, 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 the program dedicated to this debate. We just take one step at a time, one topic at a time. And uh, I pray that the Lord will let us uh, leave this place, uh, not the ones that we came here, but uh, different ones with different mind and uh, a different understanding. And I praise him for the the words that he gave first to me and then through me to you. Because I take these words, first of all, to my own heart. If I, if I don't take the words to my own heart, I have no right to stand before you and share this word with you. Jesus said, look at those guys. They say, but they don't do. So don't follow their path. Uh, they call it in psychology dissonance. Cognitive dissonance, it is something you know about or you believe and something else the way you live. That's, that's a dissonance between <laughs> what you believe and what you live. So we have to pray for harmony, for a celestial, divine harmony between what we believe and the way we live. And we must not let the, the garment of the Lord offhand uh, like Jacob saying, I would not let you go until you will not transform my beliefs into living in life. So uh, today we are going to approach one of the, I believe it's the greatest of all uh, things in concerning Christian living. Many people live and die without understanding this. They miss a lot. They lose a lot, a lot. We are blessed by being today here and approaching this topic that uh, was quoted by Judy in uh, Revelation 6, 2. Uh, the Bible says, um, then I looked and there was a white horse. Its rider had a bow 
and a victor's crown had been given to him. I want you to, to underline every single word is very full of meaning. Absolutely. If we catch this truth today and we go back in our lives with this truth clear in our mind, we got a great key. It's like a theorema in mathematics. When you know that we, the Romanians are very good with mathematics, and uh, when I, I had those formulas in my mind, I was not afraid of anything where you could approach everything because that was the law. In the triangle, yeah, you know that these two sides and the, the other side and they are related and they, you know that that's a law everywhere. And if we get this today, it's a law that it's applicable to every single aspect of our lives. So mark down every single word, please. I did that myself. I didn't observe these words before preparing my soul to be with you today. I've been reading them for half a century. But only now, I mark the difference. I said, Lord, maybe I'm late. But thank you for not being too late. And in this text, the main word is that the writer, before starting the war, he was a victor. He got the crown of victory before starting the war. And that's the key. The second part of the verse said, he went out as a conqueror and to conquer. So, usually we pay attention to the destination, and that's very good to, to know, to fix your eyes upon the destination. The destination is Christ. Yes, this is our, our divine destination. But this must not blind your eyes toward the journey that you have from, this po from point A to point B, from this point to the destination. You must not walk blindly because you have the destination in mind. You have to take care and to pay attention to every single step you have to take. That's the secret. That's the daily walk with the Lord. That's what Enoch did walking with the Lord. Yes, I go the destination, but if I don't walk with the Lord toward this destination, the destination will be just a theory in my mind. I will never reach that destination if I don't walk with the Lord. And I don't pay attention to, to the space between the point A where I am right now and point B where I'm supposed to, to be. I have a friend uh, back in Romania. He has an eye disease, an, an eye problem. Imagine, try to imagine. He can't see anything. It's all black, all blind, the first 20 feet. Nothing. Some cells are dead in his eyes. Something happened to him. He has his retina two times uh, needed to be fixed. Something happened in that process that literally blinded his cell for the first 20 feet. Then he sees a bit further. But he never sees the, the immediate space in front of him. Imagine how stressful that has to be when you drive your car and you don't, don't see when you walk. Yes, I see. There is a good road there, but what is between this place and the other one could be anything. It's a permanent stress. So we have to understand that the aim, the target, the destination, as Paul said, I'm running toward, the, toward my target. My target is Christ. I'm running toward, but I'm not ra running like a fool or like a blind. I'm not hitting the air when I fight. I know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm paying attention to every single step I'm taking toward this destination. Otherwise, I will never reach that. You follow instructions on your GPS, on your, on your map, every single detail. You could not allow yourself to just step over one of the things. Yeah, it says to the right, but I'm going to go to the left. It's just once. No, if you, if you change the direction, you just change the direction. It's a different destination. You're going to reach somewhere sometimes, or, but it's a different destination. Now, Mark, please. The very first word, he was given a victor crown before going out for the war. 
So the application. You have to have the Victor crown, the Victor's crown in your heart before starting to speak. Before even starting, starting to think. Before walking, you have to have the Victor's crown in your mind. Before doing anything. Only the conqueror, he left, says the word of God. He went out as a conqueror and to conquer. Only the conqueror will conquer. You don't go there to see if, we'll, if you will conquer or not. You will be conquered for sure. You go out conquering a conqueror already. If you don't go out as a conqueror, you are conquered already in your own heart. This is the religion Jesus brought on planet Earth and is going to stay here until the image of God is going to be everywhere. Until the knowledge of God is going is to embrace this planet like the waters over the seabed. The Earth is going to be full of the knowledge of God. I know there is a lot of resistance today. Hell itself is against the gospel. But that doesn't matter at all. We saw the match. <laughs> we know the result is going to be like Jesus said that. The gospel will be everywhere. And the knowledge of God is going to surround the planet Earth like the atmosphere surrounds this the blue little thin veil that surrounds this planet and makes life possible. Uh, Viktor Frankl used these words, and I want you to, to to help me understand that you got it. Viktor Frankl says that what is to give light must endure burning. What is to give light must endure burning. He went out as a conqueror to conquer. He went out with the victor's crown on his head, not to get it. He had it. So if we relate our lives with every day's trials, with this in mind, I am not a fighter. I am a victor. I don't talk about, there is no dialogue with death. It's a, it's a death and life matter. There is no instance in God where he would say, yeah, you can worship idols now. That will never be. No. God is God. That's all. It will never be this change. We, have the, have the, we need to have the same mind. This is the mind of Christ. There is no room in my life for this kind of thoughts or this kind of things to do. No room in my life. If the life is full of Christ, there's going to be no room left for anything different. I don't want to name it, but it will come in different forms to each and every one of us. Yes, the one that is to give light must endure burning. You should better don't open your mouth if you are not a victor. If you don't have full control over your heart, over your temper, over the content of your words, full control, then you open your mouth and you talk. Otherwise, there is a, another victory to just shut up. Don't say a word. And say, I'm not in the position to fight today. I am doing very bad. I have other things to do prior to this. So watch. You have to be, you have to conquer. You have to be a conqueror in order to conquer. They talk today about post-Christianity. Such a thing doesn't exist. You know where they are going? To the pre-Christian era, in the pagan era, back before. Because there are only two ways. And if you abandon the way of the Lord, it's the other alternative. Nothing else left. There are only just two. So if we would reject this word of God, 
that we need to be conquerors and victors before starting the war, before fighting for the Lord or for what is right. I have to conquer myself before conquering other things. If I am defeated in my struggle with myself, I am literally uh, easy, an easy prey for the devil that just watches. And we'll, we'll have some very, very startling examples. One of my um, schoolmates in the high school, we had a long talk about uh, faith back in, in the communist Romania. I saw I lived under the worst conditions of communism. And I see some buds here in America. I hear their talks about that. And I said, demons uh, disguised like men, like wanting, wanting the good of the society, promising to the man that one or the other one. But, but I, am, I come from that place. I know what's behind this kind of words. And maybe that person is deeply sincere. But as Jesus said, they don't know what they're doing, where they want to take the country. So the word of God was such a way for this young lady that I was talking with that it literally stirred her mind. You are not allowed to talk about God anywhere. Like here in America, they had another kind of climate. Here they call, is not politically correct. But every lawlessness in open daylight, that's politically correct. Not the righteousness of God, that's not politically correct. I got the message, yes, and I need to know it. But that lady, after talking extensively about God, he came back and wrote me a little card with a message. And her message sounded like this. In the city of righteousness where you live now, you can be killed, but not defeated. That was her thought. I never, I will never forget. Sophia was her name, wisdom. Yes. And she wrote me this message. In the city of righteousness where you live now, you can be killed, because she knew the climate in Romania, but you cannot be defeated. So that's what we studied this morning. It's living in this city, outside of this city. There's no need to talk about. So um, I would like to take a, a practical example. It's, it's so very well known to all of us. But I will illustrate this principle that you have to be a victor, first of all, upon your own life, inside of your own heart, and then you can go out. You go as a conqueror and to conquer. You follow in the steps of the Lord. If you do that, if you are defeated in your own heart and you could not conquer your own heart, then you will be an easy prey. So coming back to the example that the Bible presents us in the life of Samson, that man could strangle a lion, brother. You, you, Larry, you, wouldn't, you cannot imagine how, how a man can strangle a lion. And how was that lion screaming like a kitten in the hand of this man? And he squashed. Mm. And the lion <coughs> suffocated. And then he threw the lion like trash. That was Samson but he didn't do the same with his own heart. He could not strangle his lust for women. He could not control his eyes. He didn't control his thoughts. I have a friend back in Romania. He's a doctor, veterinarian doctor. I love and respect this man. One time at the New Year, uh, we were, uh, coming, uh, were coming in Romania at the New Year with a, a prayer that we, like we have every Sabbath morning here, some, some prayer requests. And uh, we asked, I was there at the pulpit, and I asked everybody, 
I said, what would be your prayer for next year? And he was struggling with the same problem as Samson was struggling. And he said, my prayer to God, my desire, sincere desire to God, I want to express it publicly. His wife was there. He said, I am asking God to take out, to pluck out my eyes this year if he cannot help me another way. Well, I was, I was uh, impressed by his request because I saw his determination. But in the same time, there is no wisdom in that because it was not the eyes that were the problem. <laughs> it was the heart. The victory had to be fought somewhere else, not with the eyes. He had to conquer his own heart, his own thoughts. Then the eyes will follow naturally. That's why the Revelation 6-2 has the secret of victory. You have to win that victory inside of your own being, inside of your own heart, before anything else, before speaking or manifesting yourself or meeting different situations, you have to be a conqueror over your own heart. And then you go in the name of the Lord. You know very well the story of David. And it was so simplistically told us and uh, it was so incomplete transfer from generation to generation. David fighting against Goliath. He slings, bang. Wow. That was straight to the point. It's not the whole story. It's just one page, one part. Least important. This is just the consequence. David had to fight with other giants that were inside his own heart before fighting to that guy. He never said, I am coming against you with a sling and a stone. No, he said, I'm coming against you in the name of the Lord. He had to face, first of all, the derision, the despise, the contempt of his own family. Imagine that he was anointed as a king by Samuel. Samuel said, God sent me here. And when the ceremony was finished, father said, go back to your ship. Who? The king of Israel. <laughs> they wouldn't even pay attention to that. As long as God didn't follow their proposal, they didn't want to have anything to do with God. They showed all disrespect possible. And then going on the battlefield. The whole army was impressed with the young man that wanted to fight the giant, except his own family. Who are you to come here, has said his brother. Go back to those ships. Forget about fighting against Goliath. Who are you? And David said, am I not allowed to even to ask questions? This is what I'm doing. And then he talked with the king. And the king said, don't do that. Extremely dangerous. I don't dare to do that. So that's a professional warrior. You should do that. Well, I'm not talking from the war point of view, said David. I'm talking for the Lord's point of view. I don't think that guy is more powerful than God whom he cursed. So because he was discouraged and despised from all directions, he conquered the giant of his own heart. And he encouraged himself in the Lord, says the Bible. Very few of us could survive to the indifference of others around us. Especially when our hearts are open and we would like to do something beautiful and you are met with total cold indifference. It's very, very hard to survive that. It's very hard to survive somebody uh, taking you in derision, belittling you, or even talking about yourself with contempt. It's very hard. Look at Peter. When that, he, he was ready to, to die for Jesus, but he was not ready to die to self when that lady said, you know, it seems that you are part of those guys. Me? 
He was ready to die. And the man was not free of his sin. I'll tell you, don't, don't believe in this kind of hocus pocus miracles because that is not true. It's a, a, it's a lifetime of fighting, of struggling, of warring against evil and against darkness. Peter has not changed. He was afraid of that person. That was before the death and resurrection of Jesus. After that, he was afraid of other people coming from the church, of some members of the church that came and see him eating with the Gentiles. He was afraid and he turned the corner. I was not you. I was not. <laughs> he, the, just the same person. Nothing changed. Because in his mind, there was a, um, a, a system of values. Uh, for him, watch closely, please. For him, being a hypocrite, it was less than eating with the Gentiles. Being a hypocrite was nothing to him. He started manifesting his hypocrisy. It was nothing to him. He was drinking like that, but not to be seen in the company of those people. So there is a system of, system of values, and you, you have to have the mind of Christ. First of all, no kind of hypocrisy in your heart and mind. Then we can talk about eating or not eating with the Gentiles, but as long as you are defeated in your own heart and you are a hypocrite and you confess one thing, you say you believe one thing and you live differently, then you can't talk about conquering in that situation. He was defeated upstart. The Revelation, the book of Revelation says he went out a conqueror and unto conquer. That's the secret, and we have to take that in our mind. Uh, every temptation or trial comes accompanied by something that is tempting to us. I am a fisherman. <laughs> I'm sorry to say that I go very, very rarely. Once every 10 years I went fishing. I would go every single day, I'm telling you. Every day that I don't go fishing is a lost day, I'll tell you, yeah. But I lost all these years and days. I have no time for that. I should, I should. I know it's healthy, it's good. I should, but I don't have a bit of time. I don't make this time for myself. But the other week I saw something absolutely significant. Can you imagine? We use different kinds of baits when we go fishing. And, uh, do I talk with somebody that is in the, here? <laughs> you, you need to put the right, <laughs> you need to put the right bait for the right fish. If you try to get trout with uh, a catfish bait, trout is never pay attention to that. Or the catfish to the trout bait. You have to use the right bait. And the devil is a very skilled fisherman. If you look in his notebook right now, with it, there is your name, it's all kind of bait would you take? <laughs> In his notebook, it's every single name, every single kind of bait you take. You prove that on your way. He, he marked the fact that you paid attention to that. Samson was going through that valley and that lady was there and he looked at Samson to see what kind of look he has. Uh oh, he pays attention. He bites into this. He marked there. That was all. It was there a lot of food. It was there drugs. Uh, everything was in that city. Samson wouldn't pay any attention, but he would pay attention to this one. That's the bait. And the devil put it in the hook. <laughs> no fish should take just a hook. It has to be a bit of bait there. And last week I saw something very interesting. A fisherman using a live duckling, a live one. He tied that duckling in, on, on the pole of his, uh, and he was keeping that duckling above the water. And the catfish, to catch the duckling, he was 
pulling his duckling. Do I say right, duckling? He was pulling his duckling up, but in the same time, the spear was in his hand. Uh, the guy was dying like that. That was the devil does. He has the bait and the hook inside, but the spear in the other hand. And anybody who would dare even to look to that bait and don't pay attention to the, that would pay with his life. So Samson saw the duckling, but he didn't see the spear that was going to take out his eyes and make him the last stock of the Philistines. It's the same principle. No difference at all. Yeah. It appears on the screen of your computer, and you just tarry one second or two seconds there. That's all. If you just pay attention, somebody will take note that you paid attention to that picture. And then, near your name, he reacts. How, how do you call this in, in the medical field? That, uh, you, you react positively to a, to a medicine. Uh, the, oh, the, the, the answer. Uh, the, the, body, the body answers to this kind of medication. Or the body doesn't answer. So Joseph's body didn't answer to that type of medication that the lady offered to him. His body didn't answer. <laughs> he said, no, that's not, it doesn't work on me. It has, and Jesus said, the, the master of this world is coming, but in me he has nothing. Did you mark the word? He said, in me. In me he has nothing. Because if he has something in you, then we'll always have something for you. If he has in you, that's the main area where the Lord called us to go as conquerors and unto conquer. It's about our own being. Yes, says 2 Corinthians 4, 8, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. Watch the dialogue between outside and inside. We are troubled on every side, that's outside, but not distressed, that's inside. We are perplexed, but not despaired. Outside, inside. We are persecuted, but not forsaken, inside. And cast down, but not destroyed, in your mind. So it's permanently this dialogue. Paul says, yes, outside everything looks bleak. But inside, everything thrives in the presence of God. The main thing we lose sight of, it's this part of the journey toward our destination. That is as important as the destination itself. They say today that the journey is the destination. No. The journey is the means toward the destination. It's it's logic to say that. But you cannot just lose sight of that. You cannot ignore. If you ignore the journey, you're never going to see the destination. So you have to pay attention to your journey. You have to pay attention. The, the, the equation of life, it's a thought, it's a feeling, and it's something to do right away. It's too late to start and to try to control your feelings. Too late. And it's of no avail. It doesn't help. You feel that way. You weren't doing that. It's too late. You have to go back to the well, to the spring. Where from did this feeling come? It came from some thoughts. That's why the Bible said we turn upside down the thoughts of our mind, and we make every single thought a captive of Christ. That's the victory right here. Then outside is just a natural consequence. It's like a fruit tree producing fruits. That's absolutely natural. It's a joy, no effort. In the, the apple tree doesn't put any effort 
in producing apples. It's, it's its own nature. But the heart that was not submitted to Christ has a terribly hard time being faithful to God. That's why many Christians went into the mental hospital place. I, I met a lot of Christians. I visited them there. It's not an easy task. Because their mind knew of a kind of life they should live, and they saw in their own lives a different course, and that literally broke their mind. Schizophrenia means breaking the mind. It's a Greek word, breaking the mind. It's broken between what you know and what you believe, and you know you sh the way you should live and the way you live. It's, it's, it's a breaking point. But if the heart is changed, and this is the new covenant, the new covenant talks not with deeds or with lifestyle, we made a God out of the lifestyle. That's an idol. No, the new covenant, it's about the heart. And the lifestyle will follow naturally. You don't need even to, to you don't need to teach a duckling to swim. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, uh, it, it's in the nature. The religion of the heart, the thoughts, the feelings, Everything going inside, they will come either from Christ or from the evil one. What Judas did to Christ was natural. Why? Because the Bible says the devil put a thought in Judas' mind. That was the point where Judas had to have fighting to death not to accept that thought. You just run to God and tell him these kind of terrible thoughts are coming in my mind. I don't want to live with these kind of thoughts. I might like them, but I don't want them. So I'm coming to the Lord with my thoughts and I submit my thoughts to him. Look what, what happened in my mind. Where is God in the hour of temptation for our first parents? Where is God in the hour of temptation? Nowhere to be found in their conversation. Oh, it's remote. He said something, but he's there. They didn't turn when they proposed, why would, if you would eat this kind of fruit? It looks very nice and it's, it's, it's pleasant to the eyes and uh, it will open your mind. It will do a lot for you. What if you. They didn't turn to say, Lord, please, did you hear this? Uh, Neighbor of ours, the snake. Did you hear this guy, what he said? What do you think about his proposal? When they would turn back to see what the reaction of the snake would be, the snake was nowhere to be found. Because you talk to God about your thoughts. The evil, the bad thoughts disappear. I, I am a witness myself. They disappear when you turn your eyes toward Jesus, before talking in anything with him, when an evil thought comes in your mind and you turn your eyes toward Jesus, they disappear instantly. That's being a conqueror in Jesus. I, want, I would like to, to mark that there is a huge world of a difference between believing in God which the demons and the world does, and believing God when he speaks in what he says. It's a world of a difference. It creates two lives, two kind of lives, different like day and night. It is one thing to believe in God. Every sane mind believes that there is a designer behind the design. Every sane mind. But that's not believing God on his word. That's a different, completely different story. In Japan, it was an, uh, uh, an, an evangelist had a translator. And uh, the evangelist presented the gospel to the Japanese group that was there. The translator was interpreting. He, he was fluent in English. And uh, when the evangelist uh, talked about the resurrection of Jesus, uh, the, event, the, the translator just stepped aside and said, that cannot be true. No. 
And then the evangelist said, are you my translator or my interpreter? <laughs> he said, I asked you to translate what I say. He said, no, this cannot be true. It's a, it, it, well, of course, he, be, <laughs> he believed in the evangelist because the evangelist was there. But he didn't believe him when he talked about the resurrection of Jesus. It is a world of a difference to believe in God like the devil does or to believe God when he tells you, don't even look in that direction. I'm, I'm saying this for you, says God, not, not for me. You don't steal anything from my God. You steal from your own life. Don't look in that direction. Don't even think on that. Don't do that. Don't do the other one. Don't do the, everything is said with you in mind and you think it's a restriction. It's not, it's a protection against death. That's all. If we could understand this, but we were children and we were so angry with our parents when they told us, no, you are not allowed to do that. Why not? We thought it's good. <laughs> they knew something that we didn't know. That's why. Then we, when we grew up, we told our own children, don't do that. <laughs> why not? Because I've been there and I know what this is. So it is the same with the Lord. He says, don't tarry upon this kind of thoughts. My youngest daughter, Christina, she is graduating from law school in Irvine, California. This I mean, next year. She, she was little and she, she uh, we were in a uh, special, I had heaven on earth while I've been here. I know how heaven is. I'll tell you, it's real. And uh, she called me and said, Daddy, yeah, I was uh, during a camp, an evangelistic campaign in Chicago. And she, that was 20 years ago. She called me and said, Daddy, a bad thought came in my mind, what, can, what, what, what must I do? What can I do? And I said, let it go. It's not yours. Let it go where it came from. <laughs> Don't even tarry to mark or to, to notice its presence in your mind. Just ignore it. Uh, because the greatest victory over sin is not overcoming the sin. See, I didn't sin. The greatest victory is to be dead to sin. No reaction at all. You don't exist for me. To be dead for sin doesn't mean to fight with the sin, to struggle with it, and even to, to win this match. No. The fact that the sin gets your attention, it's not a good sign. You should not stay. You should not tarry on that spot. We should be dead towards sin. This is what we are called to be. But in the same time, you should be alive. That means alert, mind open, the mind connected with God. While you are dead to sin, you are alive to God. These two are two simultaneous operations. If you are not dead to sin, and your, uh, your clock still reacts when you see the sin, then you are not alive to God. You are alive to that sin because you react. As soon as you heard that word, you, you react about it. As soon as you saw that stuff, mm, saliva, no. You should be dead. It wouldn't be, have any part negative or positive in your life. It should be, sin should be totally ignored by a person who is dead to sin. Has no message, no meaning, no appeal for my heart. If I see any form of appeal to my heart, I am going to tell Jesus. Hey, you know the song, I'll, I'll tell Jesus right away. As soon as I intend telling him, things change in my mind right away. They disappear, they evaporate. This is a continual struggle and we need to have the real reason to stand. If we don't have the real foundation or, or the rock to build upon, there is no victory. It's gonna be a long struggle and it's gonna end into a very tragic defeat. Jesus said, you dare, I conquer the world. And everybody that is in Jesus is a conqueror of the world. 
the world has no say in his life. Robinson Crusoe, he said he was in a voyage with, uh, on, on the sea, and they were so close to death, it was a storm. And he swore in that storm that if he would survive, he would never go back again. He swore in that situation. Well, that, that doesn't have much meaning. Many people uh, trust cancer or wars or famine to convert them to God. That's not, nothing in this. And then Robinson says, though I swore that I will never do it again, he said, I went back for another voyage on the, on the sea, not ashamed to sin, and yet ashamed to repent. If you don't have the rock of ages as the foundation of your lifestyle, of your decision to or not to do that, it is a, just a human effort. That was all. But the word of God is leading us to the real victory that is in Christ Jesus and to that definitive final answer in victory, which is the ceiling we talked about. That's the irreversible victory. Your human being dedicated yourself forever to God irreversibly. During my time in prison, I was visited by a very high rank uh, officer who tempted me with all kinds of privileges if I would offer my services to the secret services in Romania. They would appreciate my intellectual condition and they said, we need a man like you. I didn't know what to do because some people who said no, they disappeared next day in an accident on the street. You cannot just say no. If you say that, you're kind of lost. You need the guidance of God for every single word. You need to have the inspiration of the Holy Spirit when you answer. Jesus didn't just talk with the high priest. No, he said, the Father told me what to say and how to say it. And I told this chronicle, I said, I I highly appreciate your offer. Nobody ever in my life offered me this kind of privileges in a country like Romania in that time. I don't want to mention them to you. That would be nothing to you today, but they would mean everything to a man, young man like me back in Romania. But I was on the hotline with the Lord and I knew I was facing the devil that was so kind to me, way more dangerous than when the devil is cruel to you. He was so kind to me. I want a future, a bright future for you. I'm offering you these privileges. You will be that. You will do that. Not stay here in the prison rotting in this kind of cell. Compare. See the difference. Yes, the God helped me to see that the duckling that was there <laughs> was accompanied by a spear ready to kill. But only God can do that to you. Otherwise, you see the duckling. <laughs> That's all. No. I'm going to say, Mr. Colonel, with all my res respect, and uh, I want to tell you that nobody ever offered me a perspective like the one you are offering me right now. Still, we have a problem, a very serious one. What's the problem? The problem is that I am a born again Christian. What's that? Well, being born again, it's an irreversible process. If you are born, you cannot be unborn ever. You are born. <laughs> What's that being born again? He said. Yeah, it's a spiritual, spiritual. Yeah, it's a spiritual condition where you go, you are transformed, and you have no way to go back to your previous condition. That's irreversible. And the colonel, whom I highly respect even today, the colonel stepped back and said, man, I cannot help you then. 
he was sincere. He, he sincerely wanted to help me. He didn't know what he was doing, but he wanted to, to do something for me. He, he really appreciated me. He, he offered me the best he knew at that time. And he stepped back and said, no, that, that, then you, you cannot be helped. Yes, I know. I cannot be helped. I am in a hopeless situation, I told him. There is no turning back. Sorry about that. Yeah, I made you the offer. Please don't. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no way. Yeah, you can write a letter to your mother. I will take that with me from the prison outside. You can write whatever you want. It's on me. I sat at the table. I wrote a few lines to my mother. I gave the envelope open to the colonel. He said, no, 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 seal it. I'm not going to read it. And I sealed the envelope. I gave it to him. And the letter went to my mother. Everything was true about that man. But also it was true about me. And it is true about each and every one of us. Once you've been born, you cannot be unborn ever. That's a one-way irreversible process. If you can reverse the course, you are not born again yet. It's just a theory in your mind. It's an illusion. If you can reverse the course. If you cannot reverse the course, that's the real, the real stuff coming from God, the real being born again. The other day, a lady, uh, it's an article. I didn't get the article, but I heard a, a minister, a trusted man, talking about this article. A lady went to the veterinarian and told him about her pet. She had a boa constrictor, you know, that uh, kind of uh, huge snake. She had a boa constrictor as a pet in her own home. And she raised him since that little snake was little like that. And now it was a big, a big snake. And she complained, and please watch carefully. It's about ourselves. And she complained to the veterinarian, there are days and days and weeks since the boas stopped eating. <laughs> the doctor said, yeah, the, 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 they can't survive for a long time without food. But what would be the cause, said the lady, because up to this point, I had no problems of this kind. Is it going to die? No, 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 said the veterinarian. Tell me something else about the, the pet. Well, she said everything is normal. I take the pet sometimes with me in my bed, and the pet sleeps with me in the same bed. No, no problems at all. Doesn't manifest anything. Oh, no, said the, the veterinarian. Does the snake stretch its body along yourself? Yes. I just was wondering, because it never did that before. The snake stretches itself along my body in the bed. It sleeps like a person. Is there with me? And the veterinarian said, my lady, you know what the snake is doing? No. He's preparing himself to eat you. <laughs> That's why he didn't eat for such a long time. That's why he's measuring his body along yourself. He came to the time and is ready for his prey, and you are his prey. This snake grew up with this idea in mind. A snake is a snake and forever will be a snake. It will not change with time. It will be there on one of these days, you'll find yourself suffocated by this snake. That is so kind, now you're petting. This is the phenomena. As soon as that la the lady put the snake back in the cage, never took it out, started eating because <laughs> the, the prey was not available anymore. <laughs> it, has to, it has to have a message for all of us. We cannot try to, and we shouldn't try to tame snakes at all. Because sooner or later, the snake having just one plan in mind, and that is your destruction, that will happen. Sooner or later. You heard of so many cases of people in America 
being beaten by their bulldogs. Um, there, there are species of, of dogs that at certain age kills and destroy them or being beaten by a scorpion or by, by their pets. They ended up so badly. So that's why Jesus said, you need to conquer in your heart. Not, don't try to tame the snake. The head of the snake needs to be crushed, not tamed. Because it's not tameable. You cannot tame a snake. It's going to be there. Uh, David Hamachker, the Secretary of, uh, General Secretary of the United Nations, you cannot play with the animal in you. You cannot play. Uh, some thoughts, some, it's just, yeah, come on. Everybody is doing that. Yeah. It's everybody's business. But as for me and my house, we are not to be in everybody's business, even if the whole country will go a different direction. He said, you cannot play with the animal in you without becoming fully animal. That lady was proposed to become the snake muscles, to become a snake by digestion, you know. <laughs> she would become a snake. And Hamachiel says, you cannot play with the animal in you without becoming fully animal. He who wants to keep his garden tidy doesn't reserve a plot for weeds. Ew. Because those seeds are going to fly everywhere. If you play with lies, you lose your sensitivity to truth. And truth or lie, it makes no difference for you. You just come to believe the lying promise of satisfaction. It, it's going to paralyze and disable your discernment, the discernment <coughs> of your mind. Of course, I believe in closing that we uh, persevered all our lives, some of us for a long time. Some of you have been in church for decades and you persevered. But perseverance has no value if we don't persevere to the end. The end of our perseverance is the price. But we don't walk toward that price, toward that victory, empty or vulnerable. No, we walk as victors. We wear the crown of victory before getting the crown. This was Christ. And he is doing the same work in our hearts. Nothing in this world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Education will not. The world is full with educated derelicts. Persistence, the perseverance of the saints, that determination alone of staying in Christ, of fighting in Christ, of conquering in Christ, that's the only one that will bring us the victory. I want to close with the word of Christ. You dare have courage. I conquered the world. This world, it's already conquered. And everybody that accepts today to be in Christ Jesus, he has the victory over this world. As John says in his letter, what wins, what gains the victory over the world is our, is our faith, is us believing 
God, not in God, but believing him. And this is my prayer for myself and for all of you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Precious Father, thank you very much for teaching us today the science of a real holy war, not the way people understand it, but the war against self and sin, against our own sinful nature. We are very pleased to find out today that you conquered this world and that you share your victory with us. Help us to walk in Christ. Help us to believe you in every single promise you gave us. And you assured us that as you conquered, we will conquer in you. In Jesus' name, amen.